Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the May 2023 edition of the Southeast Monthly Climate Webinar, where we talk about the climate and special topics pertaining to the Southeast region. Uh, my name is Chris Furman, the Regional Climatologist with NOAA's Southeast Regional Climate Center, and I'll be giving a climate overview of the past month. Our other speakers today are Jeff Dober from the Southeast River Forecast Center, who will provide a water resources update, Pam Knox from the University of Georgia, who will provide an agricultural impacts update. And this morning, we have two special topics presentations. Uh, first, I'll be discussing our wet bulb globe temperature forecast tool, uh, including some updates for the upcoming heat season. Uh, and then uh, Kelsey Satellino from NIDIS will show us the improved and expanded state pages on drought.gov. Uh, so again, thank you all for joining us this morning. Just a reminder to type your questions and comments into the question box at any time, and they'll be answered at the end. Also, a recap email of this webinar will be sent out with a YouTube link to this recording in the next couple of days. All right, let's get started with an overview of the climate. So for the first time in what seems like forever, most of the southeast region was on the cooler side over the past month, uh, with some locations running several degrees below average uh, due to the passage of a few fronts, some gulf lows, and increased cloud cover. Uh, however, I say most and not all of the region, uh, as uh, southern parts of Alabama and Georgia and nearly all of Florida were, uh, again, above average over the past 30 days. Uh, on the right, we see above average temperatures were also observed across Puerto Rico uh, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, yet despite somewhat cooler weather over the past month, the year-to-date temperature rankings still show many locations observing one of their top five warmest starts to the year, uh, owing really to all that incredible warmth that we saw from late January through early April. Uh, of note, nearly all of the long-term stations in the state of Florida have observed their warmest start to the year uh, in records going back to the late 1800s in uh, many cases. So for the second straight month, we saw above average precipitation over a good portion of the region, owing to yet again the passage of a few fronts, uh, some of which, uh, some of which uh, stalled uh, over the region. Um, and bringing not only precipitation, but also more persistent cloud cover that helped keep temperatures at bay in, in, in many places. Uh, while parts of Virginia, Georgia, and the Florida Panhandle saw beneficial precipitation from a few of these fronts and gulf lows, uh, continued dryness was observed across much of South Florida. Dry conditions also persisted across much of Puerto Rico and in particular across the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, Henry Rolson Airport on the island of St. Croix uh, has only received about 40% of its expected rainfall through the first five and a half months of the year, making it one of the driest starts to the year uh, in a record going back to 1951. And if you look at the year-to-date precipitation rankings, we see that the southeast continues to be bookended with dry conditions to the north and to the south and a few wet locations in between. As we saw last month, several locations across northern Virginia and the Southern Peninsula of Florida have observed one of their driest starts to the year. So in terms of drought, we've seen improvements across Southern Alabama and really the entire Florida Panhandle, as well as Eastern portions of Tennessee, all of which are now free of any drought designation. Uh, in addition, improvements from moderate drought to abnormally dry conditions were uh, observed across a good portion of Virginia, while the area of severe drought that had expanded across much of the Florida Peninsula was upgraded to moderate drought, with additional improvements noted in southeast Florida. Some locations in these areas observed over five inches of rain over the past week, and more rain is on the way. Uh, on the other hand, the area of extreme drought in west central Florida expanded northward along the nature coast and southward along the sun and cultural coasts. Uh, some water concerns have been noted around the Tampa area and burn bans remain uh, in a few counties along the nature coast. Uh, looking in the Caribbean, we see that dry conditions continue to persist across western portions of Puerto Rico, where precipitation deficits over the past several months are now running four to six inches in places. Um, though the big story has really been the intensification of drought across the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, since the last webinar, all three islands have seen a one category degradation on the U.S. drought monitor. Uh, of note is the emergence of extreme drought on St. Croix, uh, which as we mentioned before, has only received about 40% of its expected year-to-date precipitation. 
It's also worth noting that this is the first time that extreme drought has been observed in the Caribbean region since February of 2016. So as we mentioned last time, we are in an El Nino watch, and so we are expecting a transition from ENSO neutral to El Nino uh, to occur within the next month or two, with a greater than 90% chance of El Nino persisting through the winter. In terms of strength, there is an 80% chance of at least a moderate El Nino and about a 55% chance of a strong El Nino by the end of the year. In fact, the average of the dynamical model shown by the thick red line in the figure on the right reveals a strong El Nino uh, emerging uh, perhaps as early as the fall. While most of the uh, statistical models are less bullish on the strength, but still point overwhelmingly to at least a moderate El Nino uh, later this year. Now, it's worth noting that while conditions in the tropical Pacific Ocean have changed quite a bit in recent months, the tropical atmosphere and its main uh, indices still reflect ENSO neutral conditions. And so we can't say for sure yet what the impacts will be until we see the atmosphere respond to the changing ocean conditions, uh, though forecast confidence is, as you can see, uh, rather high. So looking out over the next three months into summer, we see that the CPC is still forecasting a warm and wet summer for the region. And this is once again reflected in the seasonal drought outlook. Not much change here, uh, where drought removal is likely across the entire region. Uh, including uh, Puerto Rico. So in the short term, we are expecting below average temperatures across much of the region here over the next couple of weeks. Uh, precipitation though is split below average, uh, or is split with below uh, average amounts expected across the western part of the region and above average amounts expected across eastern portions of the Carolinas and Virginia. Uh, looking at the seven-day QPF, from uh, this is from yesterday morning, uh, we see the heaviest amounts are expected across the Florida Peninsula, which is certainly good news, uh, and along the East Coast, though this could change a bit depending on the track uh, of the low-pressure system that's expected to move across the region this week, so certainly worth keeping a close eye uh, on the forecast here over the next few days. Uh, looking up to two weeks, uh, as we turn the calendar to June, we see the western part of the region from the northwest panhandle up to Virginia, as well as much of the Florida peninsula is leaning above average in terms of temperature, while the entire region, except for South Florida, is leaning above average in terms of precipitation. And then if we look out three to four weeks to about mid-June, we see uh, somewhat higher chances of above average temperatures across much of the region, uh, with much of Florida and the, and the East Coast continuing to lean on the wet side in terms of precipitation. Uh, lastly, I just want to mention that NOAA will be releasing its outlook for the 2023 Atlantic hurricane season this Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, and you can find more information at the link there at the bottom of the slide. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Here's a summary for you to look over after the webinar. Also happy to answer any questions at the end. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff. All righty, thanks, Chris. And we'll start off looking at the stream flows here, as we always do, uh, our Southeast stream flow, 28-day uh, stream flow map across the Southeast provided by the U.S. Geological Survey. And we see a lot of green dots on the map indicating stream flows falling in the near normal range. There's some scatter gauges reporting in the above normal range, especially down across the Gulf Coast, coastal rivers, and even some below normal in their uh, North Carolina and Southern Virginia. But overall, as you can see in the Southeast runoff hydrograph there on the right, we're staying in the normal range. And as you can see, uh, we've really been in the normal range, predominantly in the normal range since at least the beginning of 2022, which has been a good thing. So, Breaking it down, next slide, we'll see the same trend in Alabama, Georgia. Let's see if we can go to the next slide. There we go. Alabama, Georgia remain in the normal range with stream flows falling off this time of year uh, with warmer temperatures and more scattered precipitation. Florida is the slight exception here. As we see, we're hovering just into the below normal range. This falls in line with what Chris was showing, the drought, uh, you know, the drought issues we've been having down in Florida. Next slide, we'll move east into the Carolinas and Virginia and we show you again, all in the green range here, meaning normal stream flows. And again, note the stream flows should fall off over the next few months as we head into summer. 
Next slide. So as far as current flood issues or high water, we have recently seen some locally heavy rainfall, especially across, across the Gulf Coast, those coastal rivers, as Chris pointed out with some smaller basins reaching temporary bankful levels. This is typical for this time of year. We're also uh, having some water route down the Savannah River there, and that is that orange square indicating some possible minor flood impacts at Clio, Georgia on the lower Savannah. So not much flooding ongoing, and this is typical for this time of year for the Southeast. And uh, speaking of typical flood climatology, we'll go to the next slide. And we're in week 21 here uh, for the southeast, and we see we are into the mid to late spring river flooding lull period. This lasts for several more weeks. There is one exception to this. Um, if we go to the next slide, and that's the Florida Peninsula, where in the next few weeks we'll enter the convective wet season, and that typically starts a slow ramp up in river flood potential through the tropical season. And we'll go to the next slide. So speaking of tropical season, as Chris pointed out, NOAA's tropical storm outlook will be coming out here on Thursday. And experts will be getting, giving their idea of the potential activity in the Atlantic Basin. For the Southeast, we generally see one out of four tropical storms in the Atlantic Basin affect the Southeast. So most do not, thankfully, but as we all know, it only takes one to really cause an issue for the season. And if we go to the next slide, as far as storms impacting the southeast and also causing widespread flooding, this is those causing uh, that are impacting, but also causing widespread river flooding, about one in every nine storms. So we generally see about one to two flood impacting storms each year in the southeast on average. And finally, our next slide here. Uh, this is the number of tropical storms that affect the southeast by week from 1960 to 2021. And it's, it's broken down by area affected, whether that be the Florida Peninsula there in the red or the South Carolina, North Carolina area there in blue or Alabama, Georgia, Florida, Panhandle, Gulf Coast region in the green part of the bar. Uh, what we see is storms often come in September, of course. We usually have a storm affect the southeast region almost every year in September. We also see June as a threat month when it comes to the southeast. Almost There's almost two peak periods, which is interesting, but also makes sense as far as origination areas of tropical storms and when and where they go. So we'll be keeping an eye out over the next several weeks. But as far as what we are expecting this summer, meaning June, July, August, we go to the next slide. We're looking at a near normal risk for river flooding uh, and pr pretty much near normal stream flows. That's following the continued trend in all aspects of the weather forecast that uh, basically Chris talked about earlier. Of course, again, keeping an eye on, on the tropics over the next few months, because the tropics can always be a game changer for the Southeast when it comes to water. And finally, our summary slide here, and we'll let you guys all read this uh, after the webinar. So now I'll pass it on to Pam to give our agricultural report. All right, well, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Jeff. Uh, we'll jump right in because we have a lot to cover yet today. So let's go on. Um, just wanted to mention that even though most of us are long past the period of last frost, there still are a few locations that have received frost in the last month, especially in the early part of May. Um, you can see the number of days they're listed. I also put a red star on here for our station in Blairsville, Georgia, which is up in the northeast part of the state in the mountainous area. They received two days below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Blairsville is known as the coldest spot in Georgia. Uh, the station is located in a valley, and so all that cold air comes down the sides of the hills and pools down in the bottom of the valley. So it's important to keep in mind that your local um, topography and other um, or graphic things are going to affect the climate in your particular fields and regions and so that's always something that's good to keep in mind. I don't expect I'm going to be showing a frost map the next month. So let's go on. Here are some of the impacts of the recent conditions on agriculture. 
We're still getting estimates of losses from the frost in March. Um, estimates now for peaches in central Georgia are about 95%. Um, and, you know, it's really unfortunate. It takes a while to really see what the effect is. Um, later varieties did better because they were not as developed as the early blooming varieties were. And other parts of the region, like South Carolina, have quite a few more peaches. And so it's, certainly there will be peaches available, uh, but maybe not as many from central Georgia as there would be in a normal year. We did see frost in the higher elevation locations, but that should be completed for the growing season, I think, by now. Um, the biggest story among a lot of the crops that we're growing is with the, with the cooler and rainier weather we've had, of course, humidity is quite high. That has meant a real increase in the fungal diseases that are affecting a lot of the different crops, including small grains, strawberries, you know, watermelon, and vegetables, and so on. You can see the picture there on the top left is a tomato plant that has had um, fungal disease hits the stem and it's pretty much um, not viable for producing any tomatoes this year. So that's certainly been a problem. Um, the cooler temperatures that we've had in the last few weeks, even though overall it's been warmer, we have gone through a period of temperatures that were somewhat cooler. That is keeping crop development a little slower than usual, especially in the northern areas of the region. Um, but certainly across the region, it's an area that people have asked me about. We we'll also noticed that pasture greenup has been slower than expected due to those cold temperatures. And some farmers are still reporting that they're feeding hay, even though you'd think this time of year, the grass is usually pretty good. Um, I have saw some reports for the first time of freeze injury to wheat from the March frost. And that has turned out to be worse than originally thought. They still have a crop, but not maybe uh, as high a yield as they were hoping. And Florida, because you know we've had drought there and very dry conditions, they've been running irrigation statewide. Uh, most of the crops in Florida are irrigated, and so um, it's not a big concern, but it's obviously a cost to the farmers because they have to pump that water for the most part. If we go on. Soil temperature has been relatively, uh, soil temperatures have been above normal because it's been relatively dry on the left hand side there. Soil moisture, this is a, a photo from this weekend. Since then, it's been wetter because we've had rain over a lot of the region. Uh, but I wanted to just show you how much you can have variation in just short distances because of that spotty summertime rainfall. And you can have one area that's very dry, not that far from an area that's quite wet. And so that's something that you really need to keep in mind when you're looking at local conditions. If we go on, been getting a few questions about degree days and you know how much we're accumulating heat over time. This is a nice tool from agroclimate.org that shows uh, actual and historical uh, degree days where you can pick the base and you can pick the time period based on when you plant. The graph that I'm showing here is for base 50 for Tifton, Georgia, down in the southern half of Georgia. And you can see uh, last season is in the blue there at the top. We're not as we're not we haven't received as many uh, growing degree days as last year, but we're pretty close to the historic average for this time of year. You can see the red is we were running a little bit behind uh, right around the end of April, early May when it was cooler, but since then we've caught up. And the projections are um, based on that green uh, fan that will probably be pretty close to the long-term historical average, probably not quite as high as last year. So that's a good tool to use if you're looking at degree day uh, accumulations over time. And if we go on, I think my summary slide here is available for you to look at later. And I'm going to turn to the first of our two speakers, which I think is back to Chris. All right, great. Thank you so much, Pam. Um, all right, so uh, now that we're kind of getting into the heart of heat season, although it for many of us doesn't feel that way, it's actually currently in the 60s right now here in uh, Chapel Hill, so it actually feels quite uh, comfortable. But uh, as we get into the heat season, we begin thinking about uh, extreme temperatures, and we begin thinking about uh, heat strain and heat stress and heat-related illness and ways that we can uh, ways that we can keep ourselves safe uh, during the summer. And so um, as, as kind of a reminder, because uh, Chip Conrad has given uh, has given this presentation a couple times uh, on this webinar, so many of you are probably familiar with the tool, but some of you haven't seen it. 
uh, yet. And we actually have a couple of updates to share since the last time uh, Chip spoke on this. Um, so always good to kind of remind ourselves of some of the tools that we have, some of the metrics that we use to assess just how sultry it is, just how hot it is, and uh, also some of the tools we can use to help keep ourselves safe. So at the Southeast Regional Climate Center, we have developed over a period of many years a web-based tool that allows us to forecast local variations in what's called the wet bulb globe temperature. And I just want to acknowledge here, of course, Chip Conrad, the director of the Southeast Regional Climate Center, who spearheaded this program, and also want to give a special shout out to Jordan Clark, Chip's PhD student who just graduated this past spring. Uh, this uh, work is, uh, or his uh, uh, dissertation work, uh, largely uh, helped uh, inform the development uh, of this tool and a lot of the updates that we'll be uh, sharing with you today. Sorry, my PowerPoint is uh, freezing this morning. Apologize for that. Okay, here we go. Um, so just a little bit of background. Uh, as we all know, uh, when we talk about heat in many parts of the country, especially the South, um, we usually talk about it in terms of a metric called the heat index. That's what the National Weather Service primarily uses to warn for heat and forecast for heat. Uh, the heat index is more of a, what we call feels like temperature uh, in that it combines the effects of air temperature and humidity um, and gives us a sense of what the corresponding um, uh, temperature feels like when we combine those, those two metrics and or, uh, variables. And, and of course, those are variables that are measured routinely at uh, weather stations. Uh, and so they're combined uh, to, to, to come up with a metric that, that kind of gives us a sense of what the air feels like. Um, and again, it's most commonly used in the U.S. to warn for heat. But as we know, there are other meteorological factors that affect heat stress, uh, and they can be uh, better assessed uh, with a metric called the wet bulb globe temperature. So in addition to air temperature and humidity, uh, the wet bulb globe temperature also includes measures or uh, estimates of wind speed and also solar and infrared radiation. Okay, and so these are variables that are really important in the context of our heat load. So the amount of heat that our bodies are um, uh, acquiring through the ambient uh, environment. And so uh, when we combine those two uh, with air temperature and uh, humidity, we can calculate uh, basically three, uh, three variables that, that help us get a sense of, of, of what the ambient heat load is um, and how our bodies are able to basically respond to that. So we take air temperature, humidity, wind speed, radiation, um, and we basically calculate three terms that are weighted there by the values that you see in uh, parentheses. We have what's called the natural wet bulb temperature. The wet bulb temperature gives us a sense of basically how far we can cool the air down via uh, evaporation, which of course is going to be influenced by um, many of the variables that you see there on the left. Uh, that's weighted the highest there at 0.7. We also uh, calculate what's called a black globe temperature. So uh, that gives us a sense of how much uh, radiation is contributing to the heat load locally. Uh, and that's weighted at 0.2. And then we have the dry bulb or air temperature weighted at 0.1. And so we calculate or estimate these temperatures using a couple of different uh, techniques and instruments. Uh, we add them up and we get a wet bulb globe temperature. Now it's important, and we'll see here later on, that the wet bulb globe temperature, we can't really think of this as a feels like temperature because it's not scaled the way the heat index is. So you're gonna see values of wet bulb globe temperature that are going to translate to pretty oppressive conditions. You'll look at the values and say, well, that doesn't sound very oppressive, okay? Because we can't look at the wet bulb globe temperature on the same scale that we do heat index or air temperature. And so as a result, what we do is instead of simply reporting the value, what we typically do is translate that value into what's called a flag level, okay? So these flag levels represent different levels of heat stress according to the wet bulb globe temperature. Many high school athletic associations in the U.S. have developed guidelines for practicing in the heat based on the wet bulb globe temperature. And so you can see an example here from North Carolina. Basically, if the wet bulb globe temperature is under 80 degrees Fahrenheit, um, you uh, you can basically practice without uh, without any uh, additional um, uh, modifications. But once we start getting into green flag and then especially yellow flag and red flag conditions, 
then we start getting into conditions where we need to make modifications in terms of water breaks, finding shade, practicing without certain gear and equipment and pads if we're talking about football, for instance. Um, and then, of course, if we reach black flag category, which is a wet bulb globe temperature of over 90 degrees, practice is uh, suspended. Okay, um, and so uh, we can we can basically determine flag levels for different locations, for different regions, and for and for different uh, activities and different uh, populations uh, as well. And and one of the things, as I'll show you here in a second, one of the things our tool our forecast tool allows you to do is adjust your flag categories. Okay, so that way when you see a forecast. Uh, or when you generate a forecast, it will correspond to, or the flag categories will correspond to the particular thresholds that are critical for your region and for your uh, interests. So just a quick overview here of some of the regional and then what, we're, what we'll really get into here are the local patterns of wet bulb globe temperature. So the regional patterns here, just looking across generally the southern U.S., you can see Across much of the deep south and throughout much of the southeast, you see the average number of days with at least one hour under black flag conditions um, is, is relatively high, okay, which obviously has to do with a lot of the humidity and high temperatures. Um, what's interesting, though, is if you look down by the coast, you actually see uh, the average number of black flag days uh, go down as we get closer to the coast, and that's because the winds usually pick up uh, in uh, coastal areas. And if you get a consistent breeze throughout the day, uh, the wet bulb globe temperature actually goes, goes down. And of course, you can see as you go up in uh, elevation and in uh, latitude, you can see the wet bulb globe temperature uh, decline, which obviously relates to decreases in humidity and temperature, um, but, uh, but also uh, increases in uh, wind speed in, in places. And, uh, and, and then, of course, as we head west, as we go west of about the 100th meridian there, uh, you can see wet bulb globe, uh, or at least the most extreme wet bulb globe temperatures decline in frequency quite a bit. That's not to say that wet bulb globe temperature isn't a useful metric in the western part of the U.S. We're actually exploring ways in which we can uh, use wet bulb globe temperature in places like the desert southwest and the intermountain west and, and, and so forth. But it's certainly a very useful tool in the uh, southeast. Uh, and, and, and as I mentioned before, there are regional patterns of, of wet bulb globe temperature that relate to these different um, uh, flag levels, which uh, can translate to different uh, levels of vulnerability, different levels of risk for uh, heat illness. So this is just a map here on the right that uh, Andy Grunstein and colleagues uh, put together, basically a wet bulb globe wet bulb globe temperature climatology for the lower 48 and it shows that most of the country can be broken down into these three regions that correspond there on the left with the different wet bulb globe temperature thresholds and obviously those thresholds are higher just like with the heat index those thresholds are higher in more southern locations they're a bit lower in more northern uh, latitudes and locations uh, and again the nice thing about our forecast tool is that you can uh, you can select your flag level, and these regions that you see here are one of those that you can uh, select. All right, so wet bulb globe temperature obviously varies regionally, but perhaps more importantly, it also varies locally. And a lot of the work that um, that we've done here at the Regional Climate Center, and, and a lot of work that Jordan Clark did for his uh, dissertation really highlighted a lot of that local variability. And you can at least begin to see that if you look at wet bulb globe temperature at individual weather stations. So the map on the right there shows the daily maximum wet bulb globe temperature, the 95th percentile value from ASOS stations over about a 20 year period. And if you look at the scale there, you can see lots of variations, even across uh, weather stations that are not that far from each other. You get the kind of the broad regional pattern, but you can look at weather stations that are just a couple miles from each other, and you can actually see that 95th percentile value might actually vary by several degrees. That can mean the difference between different flag levels on any uh, given day. And so through work that we've done, we've identified some of the factors that might influence these local patterns of wet bulb globe temperature, and they relate to things like surface type. So transitioning, and even on very short spatial scales between um, you know, uh, impervious surfaces like asphalt and concrete to artificial turf to natural grass, that can have a big impact on the variables that go into wet bulb globe temperature. The amount of shade and cloud cover uh, obviously is gonna influence uh, the amount of solar radiation and the air temperature. 
uh, humidity as well. And so there are various factors that can influence that, again, on relatively short time and space scales. And, and some of those factors are not, are not very well forecasted. Um, and then, of course, the openness of the landscape. So surface roughness is a variable that we look at, and that gives us a sense of uh, how much the, the land surface and the characteristics of the land surface help to decelerate the winds. And that's really critical uh, because wind speed, as I'll show here in a second, um, you don't have to adjust wind speed or, or alter it that much to have a big impact on the wet bulb globe temperature. And so things that would have an effect on wind speed on, on sort of local scales would be, you know, the openness of, of the landscape. So if you have a relatively closed landscape, lots of trees, lots of buildings nearby, greater surface roughness, lower wind speeds, higher wet bulb globe temperature. Contrast that with a more open landscape where you don't have as many obstacles, surface roughness is much lower um, and the winds can, can, be, uh, can be somewhat higher. So as I mentioned, local variations in wet bulb globe temperature are dictated largely by wind speed, uh, and in particular in sunny areas. So this is a figure that I believe Chip has shown before, but it really highlights how getting wind speed observations and forecasts right is really, really critical for providing an accurate wet bulb globe temperature. Um, we see that the greatest local variations in wet bulb globe temperature occur on the hottest and most dangerous days. And this is an example of a day or a situation where you have an air temperature of 86, degrees, you have a dew point of 70, and each of those lines there represents the wet bulb globe temperature under different cloud cover uh, percentages, okay? And you can see their wind speed is on the uh, a horizontal uh, axis, wet bulb globe temperature is on the vertical, and you see the flag levels there. On a completely sunny day where we have 0% cloud cover, you can see that if we adjust the wind speed, or if we de decrease the wind speed from three miles an hour to one mile an hour, we actually increase the flag level. Uh, we, we actually go from yellow flag all the way to black flag uh, conditions. So just again, small, what might seem like minor changes in wind speed can have huge impacts in terms of the flag level. And as we mentioned before, that can have a big impact on whether or not a local high school team can hold uh, practice. So here at the Regional Climate Center, we have over the last really decade or so developed a heat health research and outreach program that um, really has focused on uh, doing some some sort of fundamental science, but also some applied work, tool development, education and outreach. Uh, with regards to wet bulb globe temperature, um, Jordan Clark in particular has had the opportunity to do uh, quite a bit of field work measuring different variables that would affect heat over different land cover types. So there's some instrumentation there in the upper right that you can see. So he's used a lot of this information to help validate the models that he's uh, used and, and also the uh, forecast tool. Um, both Jordan and Chip uh, have made numerous over the years, have made numerous site visits to various high schools across the Southeast region, not only to, to get a better sense of the local variations, but to also talk with local officials, administrators, coaches, athletic directors to get a sense of what information they need. Um, and that, and that, that, that guidance has really helped in the development of, of the forecast tool. And so we now have a web-based tool uh, that predicts wet bulb globe temperature over the next five days. And we have over the last year expanded this tool to the eastern two thirds of the US. And there is interest in developing it across the entire CONUS and even bringing it down to places like Puerto Rico. Um, so that's something that we'll be looking at here um, uh, as we uh, uh, as we move forward. Uh, some of the field work that, uh, that Jordan's done in particular reveals a lot of local variation in wet bulb globe temperature and that, as we mentioned before, ties to variations in wind speed. So Chip has shown this before, so I won't go into all the details here, just to highlight that if you have a high school, say down on the coast, where again, very open landscape, few trees, flat land, you have an afternoon sea breeze and basically a steady breeze on many days, wet bulb globe temperatures are generally a little bit lower than other locations like Cedar Ridge High School located in the Piedmont of North Carolina, not, not close to the coast, um, where you have a location here that is extremely sheltered. The practice field uh, that you see there sits below the school, so it's in a bit of a pit and a bit of a low, low lying area. It's surrounded by trees, very little wind to no wind, and it's also adjacent to wetlands, a local source of uh, humidity. So when you combine the humidity, low-lying area, low winds, you get exceptionally humid and stagnant air. And so um, they observed with their wet bulb globe meter um, 
many days where the uh, wet bulb globe temperature exceeded uh, some of those really critical thresholds there for uh, holding practice. So again, this really highlights the local variability that we can see in wet bulb globe temperature. And again, a lot of this ties to wind speed, which uh, again ties to um, the local environment and the local landscape. Uh, Chip and Jordan also did some work down in Charleston as well. Uh, so focusing more now on, on urban areas, and this is gonna be a focus of, of, of our study moving forward is to try and, and get at uh, more hyper-local variability in uh, urban areas. So Jordan was able to put uh, some kestrels and wet bulb globe meters in, in various parts of downtown Charleston at the sub-city block level. And, and actually observe some very interesting variations in wet bulb globe temperature uh, that you can see here. And if you look at some of the details, again, a lot of this relates back to wind speed. Areas in downtown Charleston where the wet bulb globe temperature was considerably higher were in areas where if you looked at the prevailing wind, these were downwind of large buildings and other obstacles that would block the wind, resulting in lower wind speeds, and therefore higher wet bulb globe temperatures. So this really highlights the fact that, you know, regional variations, local variations are, are, are pretty apparent, but when you get down even to the sub city block level, you know, within, you know, within an urban area where people are walking throughout the day, you don't have to walk very, very long uh, distances to see significant variations in, in, in wet bulb globe temperature and therefore significant variations in um, vulnerability and, and risk of uh, heat, heat, heat stress. So our prediction tool. Um, so we have uh, here at the website that you see there, so if since y'all are online, feel free to go ahead and uh, go to that website. I'll give a brief demonstration here uh, in a second, but uh, we have a prediction tool that ingests hourly gridded forecasts from the US National Weather Service. These gridded products are at two and a half kilometer resolution. We use the National Digital Forecast Database as well as the National Blend of Models, and pretty soon we're gonna be going exclusively to the National Blend. Um, but these, um, these, these forecasts are uh, ingested uh, into the tool. We input variables such as air temperature, relative humidity, dew point, pressure, wind speed, cloud cover, and then information on things like solar angle and azimuth angle, so we can estimate solar radiation. Um, and then we input the data into a physically based model, which was developed by James Liljegren and colleagues back in 2008. So this is a physically based model uh, that then calculates a wet bulb globe temperature for every hour over a five day period. Um, at each of these two and a half kilometer grids. So if you go to our webpage there, again, I'm keeping the link here uh, at the top. Um, we originally developed this tool back in 2008. It was just for the Southeast US. Just last year, we expanded the domain to the Eastern two thirds of the US. You can see the domain there, uh, all the states there uh, highlighted in white uh, are states uh, where we currently have WBGT forecasts. Uh, most recently, as of last summer, we updated our flag level guideline options, which I'll show you here in a second. Um, so you have more options uh, there in terms of where you wanna set those, those critical uh, flag levels. We generate a five day wet bulb globe temperature forecast. Okay, so over the next five days, you can get a sense of what the wet bulb globe temperature is going to be at a location of your choice. And the tool also provides background information on the wet bulb globe temperature, how to use the tool and how to interpret the output. So when you go, uh, so when you go to the tool, uh, the first thing you need to do is select your location. You can begin at the top there in that text box by just typing in a location or address, and it will uh, uh, auto-populate. So if I start typing in Raleigh there, I can select various locations: uh, downtown Raleigh, the RDU Airport, various landmarks, etc. You can also, if you don't want to type in a location, you can also use the Google Map. Uh, interface to click on a, a location, basically giving you a latitude longitude, and it will provide forecasts associated um, with the grid box basically surrounding, uh, surrounding that point. Um, after you select your location, so I selected Raleigh there, um, at the bottom there, there's a tab where you can choose your flag level. And again, you can see we have a, a much more expanded set of uh, uh, guidelines, okay? Um, and so we have high school athletic association guidelines for various states. We have the different regions that I mentioned there, the Grunstein at all regions, 
uh, and then also guidelines that have been established for things like the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, we just added running races and marathons here recently, military, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, and then you choose your model run. And so once you hit submit, you'll get at the bottom after it, it will take maybe a few seconds to run, but at the bottom, you'll see a wet bulb globe uh, temperature product. You'll see a graph there uh, at the top. So showing over the next five days what the forecasted wet bulb globe temperature is, that's the solid black line. One of the things that, that is really nice about this tool and what the feedback, uh, some of the feedback that we got uh, on the tool, what's really useful is that it provides uh, obviously the, the forecast based on the expected cloud cover, but then it also generates a wet bulb globe temperature assuming 0% um, cloud cover, so full sun, and also 100% cloud cover, which could be a proxy for shade. And I'll show you here on the next slide, a zoomed in image here to kind of illustrate the significance of that. So some of the feedback that we got from coaches was, um, you know, we have the ability to move players to shaded locations and either either give them breaks or or hold practice in more shaded locations if, the, if, if we knew what the wet bulb globe temperature was going to be in the shade. So that's the nice thing about this tool. And you can see here the, you know, essentially the range of wet bulb globe temperature forecast is shown there by the, um, uh, by the shaded area there. So there's a gray line that you see there. Uh, and then there's a black line there, which usually is, what would the black line will correspond to the actual wet bulb globe temperature forecast. And that oftentimes will be in between the, uh, you know, 100% cloud cover and the 0% cloud cover, unless the forecast is 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 for one of those. But it but it basically gives you a a range. And so, uh, for instance, on Wednesday afternoon for this particular forecast, it shows that the wet bulb globe temperature um, is expected to be in under black flag uh, conditions. So this is forecasting a very sunny day. But it also shows, if you look at the bottom of that of that gray line, you see that. If you are able to access shade or if enough cloud cover rolls in that day, the resulting wet bulb globe temperature will actually drop two flag levels. And so this could be a situation where in full sun, we may not be able to have practice, but if you can get those athletes to a shaded location, then you will at least be in moderate uh, uh, conditions. And, um, uh, and so you may still be able to have practice. You'll just have to modify uh, accordingly. All right, so just want to highlight here real quick, since I know we're running out of time, uh, a couple of new features here, and, and I think uh, in future webinars we'll be able to, to highlight these a little bit more since these are things that we're currently working on. Uh, one of the things that we're going to be starting uh, here is um, trying to come up with a more accurate estimation of the clear sky radiation. So as I showed before, one of the input variables to the wet bulb globe temperature forecast tool is uh, information on basically the solar angle. So the solar azimuth, where the sun is in the sky relative to north, and then the solar angle. So it basically estimates based on your location, how much clear sky radiation is coming in based on solar elevation, based on day length, things like that. There are other ways that we can estimate clear sky radiation that may provide a more accurate measure of just how much solar radiation is coming in. So we are looking into some other um, some other methodologies that might give us a, a, a better sense of what that clear sky radiation value is, since it is a very important input to the wet bulb globe temperature model. But one of the things that we are currently working on, and this really gets at the importance that I mentioned about wind speed, is we're trying to increase the spatial granularity of the model down from two and a half kilometers to 500 meters. Okay, and one of the ways that we're that we're working on this is we're we're estimating surface roughness values, as I mentioned before, utilizing very high resolution satellite derived vegetation data across a range of spatial scales. And we're using that to basically downscale the forecasted wind speed. Uh, we are vertically downscaling from 10 meters to two meters so that the wind speed values are taken at the same level as all the other variables using the logarithmic wind profile since we know wind speed. Uh, goes up quite a bit with with height clo uh, close to the ground, but we're also using this vegetation data uh, to basically calculate surface roughness values over scales of tens to a couple hundred of meters. You can see that there in the in the table uh, down there in the bottom right. We're actually experimenting with a couple of different weights for each of the roughness values 
at different scales surrounding an individual point. So we're looking at surface roughness uh, at 30 meters around a point, but then we're also looking at it at 100 meters, 250 and 500 meters, because we know that when it comes to wind speed, it's not just the landscape around a point that's going to affect wind speed there. It's also what's what the landscape is around that point, right? So, so how that affects uh, wind that's moving into an area. And so uh, we're experimenting here, testing different, uh, different weighting schemes. The one that we think works best is the one we've highlighted there uh, in red, where the greatest weight is given to surface roughness values at 250 meters, relatively less weight is given at scales a little bit closer and a little bit further away. Um, and of course, we're validating this with observed wind and WBGT values. Um, and again, that's where we come up with this, this weighting scheme that we think works best because uh, those forecasts, the, the forecasted output best matches with the observed values that we have from the WBGT meter as well as from nearby weather stations. Uh, so we'll have more information uh, to share on this later on as we continue to uh, develop this part of the tool. So hopefully an expansion westward over time into other locations and also downscaling so that we get higher uh, resolution uh, output for uh, for this forecast tool. Uh, these are some of the key takeaways um, that I'll leave up for you to look at uh, afterwards and also happy to take questions at the end. Chip Conrad is also on the webinar today and he can answer questions uh, as well. And so uh, I will turn it over uh, to Kelsey because she has some updates from NIDUS on the uh, on the state pages. Thank you, Chris. Hi, everyone. I'm Kelsey Satellino with the National Integrated Drought Information System, or NIDIS, and I want to take a few remaining minutes of this webinar to uh, show you and demonstrate uh, a new update on the U.S. Drought Portal, or drought.gov, an update to our state pages, which you can see a few screenshots of here. Um, NIDIS worked with NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information and state partners to update and expand the existing state pages on drought.gov, with the goal to provide a one-stop shop for state drought information that can be useful for decision support, communication, and more, and also help direct users to key drought resources at the state level. So I'm going to actually share my screen briefly. And there's a long list of people here, so I apologize for the, for the delay. Um, oops. Actually, Chris, would you be able to make me presenter? Uh, let me see if I can do that. I should be able to. Let's see. Uh, oh, never mind. Okay, I found it. Apologies. I had to sort through a list of every attendee on this webinar to find that. Um, so I'm going to take you through a very brief demonstration of one of our state pages, just highlighting the key features um, that are new on these pages and that we hope can be useful for drought monitoring, planning, and communication in the Southeast. Um, so first of all, the way you get to these pages, if you go to drought.gov and go to the by location section, if you click state under browse by scale, or you can select a state from this drop-down menu that will take you directly to our state pages. In addition, you'll notice that the URL for these pages is drought.gov slash states slash and then the name of your state. So that's another way that you can easily access these pages. Each of these pages begins with some high-level statistics to help tell the story of drought in that region, such as information on precipitation rankings. If you want to learn more information about any of the statistics displayed here, you can click the learn more about these stats link right underneath these statistics. And this will provide information about every statistic and map on the page, including source information, update frequency, the valid date for all the data, as well as additional links and resources to learn more. Underneath the statistics are some of the interactive maps on the page. And that's one of the biggest new features on these state pages, additional interactive maps. You can easily tab between different maps zoom in or out, pan to different locations, or select a county to view that county's drought conditions. I'm gonna highlight our interactive maps a little bit more in just a moment. One of the other brand new features on the state pages is the addition of this drought overview section and sidebar highlighting key state drought resources. 
we added this section in response to usability testing that we conducted as well as other feedback and a survey that we ran where it became many clear uh, became clear that many people were visiting these state pages looking for state specific drought information on water use restrictions drought declarations local and regional data and we wanted to make sure we helped direct those users to relevant and reliable state government state climate office and other local and regional resources the other big change, as I mentioned before, is the addition of a lot more data and maps, as well as an update to the usability and interactivity of some of these maps. So the new state pages contain a variety of current conditions maps, including precipitation conditions, uh, both the precipitation accumulations and a percent of normal, temperature conditions, stream flow, and soil moisture. In addition, we have outlook and forecast data, including precipitation forecasts, precipitation and temperature outlooks, and drought outlooks from NOAA's Climate Prediction Center. These state pages also contain an interactive time series graph of historical drought information at the state level. And you could actually view this information at the national, state, or county level. Um, you can view three different historical drought data sets side by side. I won't go into a lot of detail right here, but please do um, explore this. You're able to zoom in on a particular time period to view that in more detail, isolate a particular percentile category to view the information more clearly, download an image of the graph, or download a CSV, XML, or JSON file of the historical data for your state. Finally, we have a variety of drought resources, uh, both state and regional resources, including state climate centers, uh, state government agencies and drought task forces, National Weather Service, weather forecast offices and river forecast centers, regional climate centers, and more, as well as information on how to stay up to date on drought information, resources on climate and drought, and ways to report local drought impacts. Now, this has been a really brief run through of the features on this page, but the one feature I really want to highlight for you is the ability to customize and share the maps on this page. It, those of you who are familiar with drought.gov will notice that we've given a bit of an updated look um, and functionality to the maps on drought.gov as well as on the state pages. For example, you can now hover over the legends on the site to view more information that provides additional context for users. For example, this map shows real-time stream flow conditions from the US Geological Survey. And you can hover over a particular category to view what percentiles that falls into with a link to learn more from USGS. You can also click these accordions for the about section to learn more about the map and the source of the data, as well as update frequency and other information. Clicking the learn more link at the bottom corner of any of the maps on drought.gov will take you to a data catalog entry with more information about that data source, documentation, and ways to access that data. Finally, if you click this download icon in the top left corner of any map on drought.gov, it will open up a larger customizable map that you can customize to your liking and download a high quality map image. For example, you can easily switch between any of the maps that are available on that page. This is a list of all the maps that are available on the Florida State page. Zoom in or out on a particular region. Adjust the layer transparency or the base map. And you can also show border outlines. Uh, the state and county lines are on display by default on all of our state pages. So you can apply or hide these on our national maps as well. You can also show tribal land area boundaries uh, by clicking this line here. And for maps that expand uh, beyond CONUS uh, that are national maps, you can also display other regions uh, such as Puerto Rico in a box on the side alongside the contiguous US. Once you have your map looking the way that you want it, you can click the Save Map button to, to download a high quality PNG image, which you can use for sharing on social media, in presentations or briefings, in drought plans, or more. One of the other things I wanna highlight about this feature, it doesn't only allow you to download a high quality map image, but to more easily compare different data sets for a particular region of interest. For example, if I zoom in on an area of interest here, um, on this 30 day percent of normal precipitation map, I can then click this drop down to select a different map on the page. 
And this zoom extent and region will be preserved, making it easier to compare information from different data sets side by side. Overall, um, I also want to emphasize that these state pages are a starting point. We have uh, created and updated these state pages in response to feedback from state partners and other users of drought.gov to try and make them a more useful resource for drought early warning and communications. But we're always looking for ways to improve these pages. So if you have any feedback, please do reach out to us at drought.portal at noaa.gov. And that email address and ways to contact us will be included in the webinar summary email that comes out in the next few days. Uh, thank you. And with that, I'll turn it back to Chris. Great. Thank you so much, Kelsey. That is a fantastic resource. Thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Um, all right, so Kelsey has the uh, there has the final slide up for us. So uh, as she mentioned, um, we'll have uh, the webinar um, summaries up and the recording up shortly, um, and you'll get an email with the link to the recording and all the key takeaways. You can see we've got over the next several months we've got some really great um, uh, special topics uh, coming up. So be sure to register for those. And as as Kelsey said, and as Meredith always says, if you have any comments uh, for us, uh, any ways that we can improve uh, this uh, webinar series, ideas for special presentations, et cetera, please, please let us know. Um, so with that, Kelsey, are there any questions in the chat uh, for, any, for any of the presenters? Yes, uh, Chris, there are a couple of questions about, the, uh, about your presentation. Um, the first comes from Joe. Um, it's a wet bulb globe temperature flag category question. And Joe says, um, the Mobile Weather Forecast Office sees Florida HSA contributions, but do not see Alabama, Mississippi. How can the missing states HSA be added? Uh, not what, not sure what those acronyms, I'm not familiar with those, with those acronyms that were, that were mentioned. Joe, if you are still on, would you mind uh, typing an additional question where you define what HSA is? I was hoping Chris would would know from context. I'm I'm I'm, I'm sorry, I don't. Chip 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 may know. Um, we can we can move on to the next question. And, okay. and Joe, if you're still there, oh, HSA means hydrologic services area, perhaps someone suggested. Okay. Um, yeah, that 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 is a good question. As far as um, as far as engagement uh with the tool we've we've had opportunities to engage with with different weather service offices we obviously haven't engaged with every potential user within you know within the region um chip probably has more to say about this um but as as the weather service begins to move towards their heat risk forecast model uh for heat there'll be more discussions i think in terms of how we incorporate things like wet bulb globe temperature into their uh, you know, into their advisory and, and warning uh, protocols. Hi, Chris. Um, um, Joe just responded. He actually meant high school athletics. So, oh, the high school or the yeah. high school athletics contributions, but don't see Alabama, Mississippi. How can the mid missing states high school athletics be added? Uh, so, we we would be interested in 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 reaching out uh, to those states um, and uh, and working working more more closely with them so we can so we can understand how those flag levels uh can be you know can be tailored to whatever local or regional conditions are most appropriate uh in those areas we've naturally done a lot of work in 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 north carolina um as well as with some other nearby states but obviously there's 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 room to expand and to engage with with more states um this, uh, this is Chip Conrad here. I just want to add that we we've done a, a search, you know, of all the basically all the states that have guidelines, uh, and I believe Alabama has guidelines that are that are the same as Georgia uh, and Florida. But we can check on that. Uh, we can check on that to see. But more generally, if anybody on this call sees any, if they're using any guidelines or they're aware of guidelines that are being used that are not on our tool, please uh, please let us know because we, we can very easily uh, add those guidelines. And we're about at the top of the hour. Um, we did have one, one final question about the wet globe 
wet bulb globe temperature tool um, about plans. Are there any plans on providing probabilistic information or probability of exceeding thresholds? Um, that may or may not be something we can, uh, Chris can answer in a couple of minutes, but I wanted to just share that final question before we wrap. Uh, I, I, I would certainly say yes, there probably are ways to incorporate the probabilistic uh, forecasts. Um, Chip, Chip probably has more to say about that, but I, I think there are certainly ways that we could that we could probably do that. Yeah, that's been uh, that has been brought up before. Uh, it's a great it's a great point, and and so it's something we'll be we'll be thinking about more in the future, and and maybe doing some research, uh, figuring out you know how how that can be done. Well, thanks. We are about out of time today, or one minute over the end of the hour. So if I did not get to your question. Um, please do feel free to reach out to the presenters um, to ask those follow-up questions. All right, thank you so much, Kelsey, and thank you again to all of our presenters today, and uh, we'll see everyone next month. Take care.